Welcome to today's on-demand webinar on haze formation in beer. This presentation will discuss haze formation in beer, its causes and remedial measures to prevent or eliminate its formation. Biological haze is primarily of microbial origin. Microbial haze will not be a part of this presentation. However, it is equally important as it has a direct impact on the quality of the beer. Non-biological haze is primarily caused by colloidal matter which makes beer appear hazy. This haze can be seen with the naked eye on account of light scattering related to its size. Chill haze forms when beer is cooled to zero degrees Celsius. It redissolves and disappears when beer is warmed. Permanent haze is irreversible. It remains visible in beer even at room temperature, taken as 20 degrees Celsius. There are various sources of non-biological haze in beer. Protein tannoid complexes are the source of chill haze and permanent haze, which are the most common type of haze found in beer. Carbohydrate haze is caused by residual starch or beta-glucans as a result of using under-modified malt or inefficient starch conversion regimes used in the mashing stage. Other sources of haze in beer are proteins and oxalates. Minor constituents in beer can also cause haze, such as metals, collapsed FOB, propylene glycol alginate, filter aids, isoalpha acids, and so on. To prevent carbohydrate haze, it is important to select the raw materials carefully. Make sure that the malt has a high degree of modification and that there is complete starch conversion during the mashing process. Then there is the aspect of process effects. These result from how the beer is handled as it moves through the brewery. Beer should not be pumped from a large diameter pipe to a small diameter pipe, and beer should not be pumped through right angle pipes. Beer subjected to harsh shear stress may transform soluble beta-glucan to insoluble beta-glucan, giving rise to glucan haze. Remedies for carbohydrate haze are mainly based on using exogenous enzymes, enzymes of bacterial or fungal origin, such as beta-glucanases, amylases, or dextrinases. These enzymes are added at the massing stage to break down and hydrolyze the starch material, which has not been completely modified. Protein haze is caused by flocculation of naturally occurring proteins. The levels of haze-forming proteins are typically assessed using the SASPL test based on titration with ammonium sulfate or the sensitive protein test based on titration with tannic acid. Protein levels can be controlled by use of a vigorous rolling boil for 60 minutes, which helps to coagulate protein. Oxalate haze is also referred to as green haze or beer stone. It is seen as deposits on the walls of the fermentation tank as small solid particulates referred to as beer stone. It is caused by an excess of calcium oxalate in the beer. We recommend that you check the oxalic acid levels in the malt. If they are high, treat your wort in the mashing vessel with calcium salts such as calcium sulfate, which is more soluble and will precipitate excess calcium oxalate upstream so you will not have problems downstream. Fresh beer should have total haze of less than 0.6 EBC units. Flavonoids oxidize and become more haze active, complexing with proteins to form chill haze. On further oxidation, flavonoids form tannoids, these complex with proteins to form permanent haze. The more polymerized the tannoids are, the more reactive they become and readily complex with haze-forming proteins. Even in fresh beer, which is usually very clear and bright, there are polyphenols complexing with proteins, but you cannot see this with the naked eye and there is no contribution to haze formation. With oxidation, the simple flavonoids become dimers and trimers that then complex with proteins to give you the reversible chill haze. On further oxidation, the dimers and trimers convert to more polymerized polyphenols referred to as tannoids. These tannoids will readily combine with proteins to form permanent haze. It has been known for a long time that haze comes about through the complexation of proteins with polyphenols. Carl Siebert expanded on this by recognizing that there are many different kinds of protein in beer. Some proteins create haze and some proteins make the foam in beer. Siebert identified proline-rich proteins as a main source of haze formation. These proline-rich proteins 
have higher molecular weight, and readily complex with polyphenols. Siebert also recognized that the polyphenols that take part in haze formation have to have at least two ends, or the chains of proteins and polyphenols would not elongate. This slide shows shelf life implications as a result of the protein component and the polyphenol component. The left-hand side of the figure represents all of the proteins in beer. Only a fraction of the proteins are haze-forming and should be removed. A shelf life of about three to five months can be achieved by removal of the sensitive protein fractions. The right-hand side of the figure represents the polyphenol composition in beer. The highly reactive tannoid fraction is the number one enemy of beer and has to be completely removed. Removal of tannoids, flavonoids, and sensitive protein can provide six to nine months of shelf life. Additional shelf life can be achieved by further removal of the monomeric polyphenols like catechin. These monomeric polyphenols in time will generate secondary tannoids. It is recommended to remove about 40% of the monomeric polyphenols to achieve up to 12 months of shelf life. On the left of this slide are the monomeric polyphenol haze precursors, such as catechin and gallocatechin. These monomeric polyphenols condense to form dimers and trimers, also called condensed polyphenols. An example of a dimer is prodelphinidin. On further oxidation, these dimers and trimers polymerize and form very large molecules called tannoids. The larger the polyphenols are in terms of molecular weight, the more polyphenolic OH groups they will have, and these OH groups then readily combine with haze-giving proteins to make protein polyphenol complexes, which then translate into the formation of haze in beer. This slide represents some evidence for the model I've just described. For this, we did a very simple experiment. We took some beer and overstabilized it with polyvinyl polypyrrolidone, or PVPP. We used a dose rate of 100 grams per hectoliter, and at this high dose level, most of the polyphenols were absorbed out of the beer and only the haze-giving proteins were left. Then we added three different types of polyphenols to this beer separately, catechin, tannic acid, and oxidized catechin. Catechin is a monomeric polyphenol, tannic acid is a tannoid, and oxidized catechin represents dimeric and trimeric polyphenols. You can see on the x-axis that these were added at different dose rates. This addition produced a dose-related response for both tannic acid and oxidized catechin. We found that catechin did not give an appreciable rise in haze formation, indicating that the polyphenols have to be oxidized before they will participate in haze formation. Here, you can clearly see that the red and green lines have fairly low values at 10 grams per hectoliter compared with 50 grams per hectoliter. The dose-related response is clear for both tannic acid and oxidized catechin. When polyphenols are oxidized, the flavonoid concentration decreases and correspondingly, the tannoid concentration increases. In a model solution that did not contain protein, the tannoid concentration increased for up to three days and then because they did not have any protein to complex with, the tannoids became larger and larger and eventually dropped out of solution. This is a model of haze formation showing total haze on the y-axis and storage time in weeks at an elevated temperature of 37 degrees Celsius on the x-axis. Before we did this work, we expected the graph to show only the incline phase, indicating that haze formation is directly related to storage time. However, what we found was that this graph was biphasic. There was a clear lag phase followed by a clear incline phase. During the lag phase, a large pool of tannoids is being generated. When you get a large enough amount of very reactive tannoids in your beer, they readily combine with the haze-giving proteins to give you the incline phase. The slope of the incline phase gives you the rate of haze formation. Chapin's law states that proteins and tannoids are in a reversible equilibrium with protein-tannoid complexes. Chilled haze is reversible. Polyphenol protein complexes can redissolve when beer warms up or when one of the components is removed. Therefore, beer should be kept cold until the addition of the stabilizer. This slide lists the factors that affect haze development in beer. The initial concentrations of haze-forming proteins and polyphenols have the most influence on haze development. Oxygen pickup is very detrimental to beer shelf life. Heat and movement, shaking of beer, are also detrimental, 
particularly when beer has to be transported at high ambient temperature on bad roads. Particulates such as carbohydrates, heavy metals such as copper or iron, as well as light, pH, isoalpha acids, and others also contribute to the formation of haze. It's very important to note that you must make your beer correctly and use the stabilizer only to fine tune the colloidal stability of your beer. Stabilizers should not be used solely as a corrective remedy. Select your malt carefully. Low polyphenol content malt is available, but a balance should be made between taste and polyphenol content, as some of these malts are less aromatic. Hop extract contains less polyphenols than hop leaves. To help reduce polyphenols during brew house processes, you can use a higher adjunct ratio with more corn or rice. Avoid weak warts. Excessive sparging can extract a lot of polyphenols into the wort. During fermentation and maturation, add yeast immediately so fermentation starts quickly, thus minimizing oxygen pickup. On the protein side, choose low protein barley malt because low protein malt produces less protein in the wort. Your mashing regime is very important for efficient conversion. Early yeast removal is important because leaving yeast in the beer will autolyze the yeast and contribute to excessive protein in the beer. In terms of process optimization, the quality of the malt is very important as well as the grind. Boiling in the kettle should be vigorous rolling boil for at least 60 minutes. This promotes protein coagulation in the wort. Many breweries mature their beer at low temperatures, such as minus 1 degree Celsius, but when the beer is filtered, the temperature sometimes rises en route to the filter. In these instances, the haze that formed in the maturation tank then redissolves, passes through your filter, and may reappear in your packaged beer when it's cooled. It is important to mature the beer at, say, 0 degrees Celsius and filter the beer at a temperature at least one degree lower than the maturation temperature, say minus one degree Celsius. Avoid oxygen pickup, particularly at filtration. The composition of chill haze is 40 to 75 percent protein, about 17 percent polyphenols, and there is some contribution from carbohydrates, ash, and metal ions. A number of different stabilizing agents have been used to reduce either proteins or polyphenols, and this slide provides a summary of methods available to a brewer. Tannic acid is very effective for, for precipitation of proteins. It can be used at very small dose levels. There are, however, two drawbacks to using tannic acid. It swells in beer and forms fluffy bottoms that trap beer and can lead to high beer losses. Tannic acid is also soluble in beer, so once the protein has been precipitated, any excess tannic acid will remain in the beer and may contribute to astringency of the finished beer. Papain is an enzyme prepared from papaya fruit, and its main drawback is that it is non-selective for protein degradation, so foam-producing and haze-giving proteins are degraded at the same time. Silica gel selectively absorbs haze-giving proteins, and polychlor stabilizers are the product of choice for polyphenol absorption. Ashland has a product called Polychlor Plus 730 Stabilizer that absorbs both the haze-giving proteins and haze-forming polyphenols simultaneously with a single addition of the stabilizer. The options for achieving beer stability are to remove the haze-forming polyphenols, removing the haze-giving proteins, or removing both of them in combination. Combined, balanced stabilization of both haze-forming polyphenol and proteins is the best option for good stability of beer. Thank you.